The Power of Creativity Imagination is not the same as creativity. Creativity takes the process of imagination to another level. My definition of creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value. Imagination can be entirely internal. You could be imaginative all day long without anyone noticing. But you would never say that someone was creative if that person never did anything. To be creative, you actually have to do something. It involves putting your imagination to work, to make something new, to come up with new solutions to problems, even to think of new problems or questions. You can think of creativity as applied imagination. You can be creative at anything at all. Anything that involves using your intelligence. It can be in music, in dance, in theatre, in math, science, business, in your relationships with other people. It's because human intelligence is so wonderfully diverse that people are creative in so many extraordinary ways. Let me give you two very different examples. In 1988, former Beatle George Harrison had a solo album coming out. The album featured a song called This Is Love that both Harrison and his record company felt could be a big hit. A common practice in those pre-download days was for the artist to accompany a single release with a B-side, a song that didn't appear on the album the single appeared on, as added value for consumers. The only problem in this case was that Harrison didn't have a recording to use as a B-side. However, Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, Tom Petty and Jeff Lynne were all spending time with him in the Los Angeles area where Harrison was living at the time. As Harrison came up with the bones of the song he wanted to record, he realised that Lynne was already working with Orbison. Harrison soon asked Dylan and Petty to join them and to sing along on the song's chorus. In a casual setting, with the minimal pressure associated with recording a B-side, these five rock legends generated Handle With Care, one of the most memorable songs of Harrison's post beatle career. When Harrison played the song a few days later for Mo Austin, chairman of Warner Brothers Records, and Lenny Waronka, head of A&R, the two were stunned. Not only was the song much too good to serve as a lowly B-side, but the collaboration generated a sound at once easygoing and brilliant that begged for a grander platform. Austin and Waronka wondered to Harrison if the team that created Handle With Care could generate an entire album. Harrison found the idea intriguing and he took it back to his friends. Some logistical items needed addressing. Dylan was going out on a long tour in two weeks and getting everyone in one place after that was going to be a problem. The five decided to squeeze whatever they could into the time they had before Dylan's departure. Using a friend's studio, they laid down the tracks for the entire album. They didn't have months to dedicate to polishing the songwriting, doing dozens of alternate takes, or worrying over a guitar part. Instead, they relied on something much more innate. The creative spark generated by five distinctive musical voices joining together. They all collaborated on songs. Each donated vocal harmonies, guitar lines and arrangements. They fed off each other, goaded each other, and most importantly, had a great time. The result was a recording that was both casual, the song seemed invented on the spot, and unmistakably classic. In fitting with the relaxed nature of the project, the five decided to downplay their stardom and to call their makeshift band the Travelling Wilburys. The album they recorded went on to sell five million copies and spawned multiple hit singles, including Handle With Care. Rolling Stone magazine named the Travelling Wilburys one of the hundred best albums of all time. I think that this is a great example of the creative process at work. Here's another one that seems completely different. In the early 1960s, an unknown student at Cornell University threw a plate into the air in the university restaurant. We don't know what happened after that to the student or to the plate. The student may have caught the plate with a smile, or it may have shattered on the floor. Either way, this would not have been an extraordinary event, but for the fact that someone extraordinary happened to be watching it. Richard Feynman was an American physicist, and one of the undisputed geniuses of the 20th century. He was famous for his groundbreaking work in several fields, including quantum electrodynamics and nanotechnology. He was also one of the most colourful and admired scientists of his generation, a juggler, a painter, a prankster, and an exuberant jazz musician with a particular passion for playing the bongos. In 1965, he won the Nobel Prize in physics. He says that this was partly because of the flying plate. That afternoon, while I was eating lunch, he said, some kid threw up a plate in the cafeteria. There was a blue medallion on the plate, the Cornell sign, and as he threw up the plate and it came down, the blue thing went around, and it seemed to me that the blue thing went around faster than the wobble. 
and I wondered what the relationship was between the two. I was just playing, no importance at all. But I played around with the equations of motion of rotating things, and I found out that if the wobble is small, the blue thing goes around twice as fast as the wobble goes around. Feynman jotted some thoughts down on his napkin, and after lunch, he got on with his day at the university. Some time later, he looked again at the napkin, and carried on playing with the ideas sketched out on it. I started to play with this rotation, and the rotation led me to a similar problem of the rotation of the spin of an electron, according to Dirac's equation, and that just led me back into quantum electrodynamics, which was the problem I'd been working on. I kept continuing now to play with it in the relaxed fashion I'd originally done, and it was just like taking the cork out of a bottle. Everything just poured out, and in very short order I worked the things out for which I later won the Nobel Prize. Apart from the fact that they both spin around, what do making records and understanding electrons have in common that can help us to understand the nature of creativity? As it happens, quite a lot. Creative Dynamics Creativity is the strongest example of the dynamic nature of intelligence, and it can call on all areas of our minds and being. Let me begin with a rough distinction. I said earlier that many people think they're not creative because they don't know what's involved. This is true in two different ways. The first is that there are some general skills and techniques of creative thinking that everyone can learn and can apply to nearly any situation. These techniques can help in generating new ideas, in sorting out the useful ones from the less useful ones, and in removing blocks to new thinking, especially in groups. I think of these as the skills of general creativity, and I'm going to say more about them in the chapter on education. What I want to discuss in this chapter is personal creativity, which in some ways is very different. Faith Ringold, the Travelling Wilburys, Richard Feynman, and many of the other people in this book are all highly creative people in their own unique ways. They work in different domains, and individual passions and aptitudes drive them. They found the work they love to do, and discovered a special talent for doing it. They're in their element, and this drives their personal creativity. Having some understanding of how creativity works in general can be instructive here. Creativity is a step beyond imagination because it requires that you actually do something rather than lie around thinking about it. It's a very practical process of trying to make something original. It may be a song, a theory, a dress, a short story, a boat or a new sauce for your spaghetti. Regardless, some common features pertain. The first is that it is a process. New ideas do sometimes come to people fully formed and without the need for much further work. Usually, though, the creative process begins with an inkling, like Feynman watching the wobble of the plate or George Harrison's first idea for a song, which requires further development. This is a journey that can have many different phases and unexpected turns. It can draw on different sorts of skills and knowledge and end up somewhere entirely unpredicted at the outset. Richard Feynman eventually won the Nobel Prize in Physics, but they didn't give it to him for the napkin he'd scribbled on over lunch. Creativity involves several different processes that wind through each other. The first is generating new ideas, imagining different possibilities, considering alternative options. This might involve playing with some notes on an instrument, making some quick sketches, jotting down some thoughts, or moving objects or yourself around in a space. The creative process also involves developing these ideas by judging which work best or feel right. Both of these processes of generating and evaluating ideas are necessary, whether you're writing a song, painting a picture, developing a mathematical theory, taking photographs for a project, writing a book, or designing clothes. These processes don't come in a predictable sequence. Instead, they interact with each other. For example, a creative effort might involve a great deal of idea generation while holding back on the evaluation at the start. But overall... Creative work is a delicate balance between generating ideas and sifting and refining them. Because it's about making things, creative work always involves using media of some sort to develop ideas. The medium can be anything at all. The Wilburys used voices and guitars. Richard Feynman used mathematics. Faith Ringgold's media were paints and fabrics, and sometimes words and music. Creative work also often involves tapping into various talents at your disposal to make something original. Sir Ridley Scott is an award-winning director, with such blockbuster films as Gladiator, Blade Runner, Alien and Thelma and Louise to his credit. His films have a look distinct from other film directors. The source of this look is his training as an artist. Because of my background in fine art, he told me, I have very specific ideas about making films. I've always been told I have this eye. 
I've never thought about what it is, but I'm usually accused of being too pretty, or too beautiful, or too this or too that. I've gradually realised that this is an advantage. My first film, The Duelists, was criticised for being too beautiful. One critic complained about the overuse of filters. Actually, there were no filters used at all. The filters were 59 days of pissing rain. I think what he was taken by was how I look at the French landscape. Probably the best photographers of the Napoleonic period would be painters. So I looked at the Russian painters of Napoleon going to the front on that disastrous journey to Russia. A lot of great 19th century views on that are frankly just photographic. I would take everything from those and apply that to the film. People who work creatively usually have something in common. They love the media they work with. Musicians love the sounds they make. Natural writers love words. Dancers love movement. Mathematicians love numbers. Entrepreneurs love making deals. Great teachers love teaching. This is why people who fundamentally love what they do don't think of it as work in the ordinary sense of the word. They do it because they want to, and because when they do, they're in their element. This is why Feynman talks about working on the equations of motion just for the fun of it. It's why he talks about playing with the ideas in a relaxed fashion. The Wilburys produced some of their best work when they were just trying things out and having a good time together making music. The fun factor isn't essential to creative work. There are many examples of creative pioneers who are hardly a laugh a minute. But sometimes when we're playing around with ideas and laughing, we're most open to new thoughts. In all creative work, there may be frustrations, problems and dead ends along the way. I know some wonderfully creative people who find parts of the process difficult and deeply exasperating. But there's always profound pleasure at some point and a deep sense of satisfaction from getting it right. Many of the people I talk about in this book think they were lucky to find what they love to do. For some of them, it was love at first sight. That's why they call the recognition of their element an epiphany. Finding the medium that excites your imagination, that you love to play with and work in, is an important step to freeing your creative energies. History is full of examples of people who didn't discover their real creative abilities until they discovered the media in which they thought best. In my experience, one of the main reasons that so many other people think they're not creative is that they simply haven't found their medium. There are other reasons which we'll come back to, including the idea of luck, but first, let's look more closely at why the actual media we use are so important to the creative work that we do. Different media help us to think in different ways. A great friend of mine, the designer Nick Egan, recently gave my wife Terry and me two paintings he'd done for us. A couple of things I'd said in some public lectures had moved Nick in a significant way. The first was, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never produce anything original. The second was, Great education depends on great teaching. I think both of these are true, which is why I go around saying them. Nick found himself thinking about these ideas and about how they'd applied to his own life, growing up and then working as an artist in London. He decided to create some paintings about them, and he worked on them nearly full-time for several weeks. Each of the paintings he did for us features one of those statements, and is a kind of visual improvisation on it. They're both powerful images with an almost primal energy, one of them is primarily black, with the words scrawled and scratched into the paint on half of the canvas like graffiti. The other is largely white, with the words written in a childlike way in dripping black paint across the background. One features a glaring cartoon-like face that's somewhere between a cave painting and a child's drawing. At first glance, the paintings seem rushed and chaotic. But a careful examination of the canvases reveals layers upon layers of other images beneath, carefully built up and partly painted over. These give the paintings real depth. He also laced each with intricate textures of colours and brushstrokes that become more vibrant as you look at them. All of the complexity in the paintings generates their sense of simplicity and urgent energy. Although my words inspired them, I couldn't have created these paintings. Nick is a designer and a visual artist. He has a natural aptitude and passion for visual work a sensitivity to line, colour, shapes and textures, and to how they can be formed into new creative ideas. He develops his ideas through paint, chalks, pastels, printmaking, film, digital imaging and a whole host of other visual media and materials. The materials he uses on any given project affect the ideas he has and how he works on them. You can think of creativity as a conversation between what we're trying to figure out and the media we're using. The paintings that Nick finally gave us were different from how they started out. 
Their appearance evolved as he worked on them, and what he wanted to express became clearer as the paintings took shape. Creativity in different media is a striking illustration of the diversity of intelligence and ways of thinking. Richard Feynman had a great visual imagination, but he wasn't trying to paint a picture of electrons. He was trying to develop a scientific theory about how they actually work. To do that, he had to use mathematics. He was thinking about electrons, but he was thinking about them mathematically. Without mathematics, he simply couldn't have thought about them as he did. The Wilburys were thinking about love and relationships, life and death and the whole damn thing. But they weren't trying to write a psychology textbook. They were thinking about these things through music. They were having musical ideas, and music is what they made. Understanding the role of the media we use for creative work is important for another reason. To develop our creative abilities, we also need to develop our practical skills in the media we want to use. It's important that we develop these skills in the right way. I know plenty of people who have been turned off math for life because they were never helped to see its creative possibilities. As you already know, I'm one of these people. Teachers always presented math to me as an interminable series of puzzles to which somebody else already knew the answers, and the only options were to get it right or wrong. This is not how Richard Feynman thought of math. Equally, I know many people who spent endless hours as children practising scales on the piano or guitar and never want to see an instrument again because the whole process was so dull and repetitive. Many people have decided that they were simply no good at math or music when it's possible that their teachers taught them the wrong way or at the wrong time. Maybe they should look again. Maybe I should. Opening your mind. Creative thinking involves much more than the sorts of logical, linear thinking that dominate the Western view of intelligence and especially education. The frontal lobes of the brain are involved in some higher order thinking skills. The left hemisphere is the area that's most involved in logical and analytical thinking. But creative thinking usually involves much more of the brain than the bits at the front and to the left. Being creative is about making fresh connections, so that we see things in new ways and from different perspectives. In logical, linear thinking, we move from one idea to another through a series of rules and conventions. We allow some moves while rejecting others because they're illogical. If A plus B equals C, we can figure out what C plus B equals. Conventional IQ exams typically test for this type of thinking. The rules of logic or linear thought don't always guide creative thinking. On the contrary. Creative insights often come in non-linear ways through seeing connections and similarities between things that we hadn't noticed before. Creative thinking depends greatly on what's sometimes called divergent or lateral thinking, and especially on thinking in metaphors or seeing analogies. This is what Richard Feynman was doing when he saw a connection between the wobbling plate and the spin of electrons. The idea for George Harrison's song, Handled with Care, came from a label he saw in a packing crate. I don't mean that creativity is the opposite of logical thinking. The rules of logic allow enormous room for creativity and improvisation within themselves. So do all activities that are bound by rules. Think of all the creativity in chess and in different types of sport, poetry, dance and music, where there can be very strict rules and conventions. Logic can be very important at different stages in the creative process, according to what sort of work we're doing, particularly when we're evaluating new ideas and how they fit into or challenge existing theories. Even so, Creative thinking goes beyond linear and logical thought to involve all areas of our minds and bodies. It's now widely accepted that the two halves of the brain have different functions. The left hemisphere is involved in logical, sequential reasoning, with verbal language, mathematical thinking and so on. The right hemisphere is involved in recognition of patterns, of faces, with visual perception, orientation in space and with movement. However, these compartments of the brain hardly work in isolation from each other. If you look at the images of the brain at work, you'll see that it's highly interactive. Like the rest of our bodies, these functions are all related. Legs have a major role in running, but a leg on its own is frankly rather poor at it. In the same way, many different parts of the brain are involved when we play or listen to music, from the more recently evolved cerebral cortex to the older so-called reptilian parts of the brain. These have to work in concert with the rest of our body, including the rest of the brain. Of course, we all have strengths and weaknesses in the different functions and capacities of the brain. But like the muscles in our arms and legs, these capacities can grow weaker or stronger depending on how much we exercise them separately and together. By the way, there's some suggestion in recent research that women's brains may be more interactive than men's brains. The jury is still out on this, but reading about it reminded me of an old question in Western philosophy that professors often give college freshmen to debate. 
It's about the relationship between our senses and our knowledge of the world. The essence of the question is whether we can know something is true if we don't have direct evidence of it through our senses. And the usual example of it is this. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? I used to teach some philosophy courses and the students and I could debate this sort of thing in an earnest way for weeks on end. The answer, I think, is, of course it does, don't be so ridiculous. But, you know, I had tenure, so there was really no need to rush this conversation. A recent trip to San Francisco reminded me of these debates. I was wandering through a street market, and I saw someone wearing a T-shirt that said, if a man speaks his mind in a forest and no woman hears him, is he still wrong? Probably. Whatever gender differences there may be in everyday thinking... Creativity is always a dynamic process that may draw on many different ways of thinking at the same time. Dance is a physical, kinesthetic process. Music is a sound-based art form. But many dancers and musicians use mathematics as an integral part of their performances. Scientists and mathematicians often think in visual ways to picture and test their ideas. Creativity also uses much more than our brains. Playing instruments... Creating images, constructing objects, performing a dance and making things of every sort are also intensely physical processes that depend on feelings, intuition and skill coordination of hands and eyes, body and mind. In many instances, in dance, in song, in performance, we don't use external media at all. We ourselves are the medium of our creative work. Creative work also reaches deep into our intuitive and unconscious minds and into our hearts and feelings. Have you ever forgotten somebody's name or the name of somewhere you visited? Try as you may, it's often impossible to bring it to mind. And the more you think about it, the more elusive it becomes. Usually, the best thing you can do is to stop trying and, as they say, put it to the back of your mind. Sometime later, the name will probably show up in your head when you're least expecting it. The reason is that there's far more to our minds than the deliberate processes of conscious thought. Beneath the noisy surface of our minds, there are deep reserves of memory and association, of feelings and perceptions that process and record our life's experiences beyond our conscious awareness. So at times, creativity is a conscious effort. At others, we need to let our ideas ferment for a while and trust the deeper, unconscious ruminations of our minds over which we have less control. Sometimes, when we do, the insights we've been searching for will come to us in a rush like letting a cork out of a bottle. Getting it together. While you can see the dynamic nature of creative thinking in the work of single individuals, it becomes much more obvious when you look at the work of great creative groups, like the Travelling Wilburys. The success of the group came about not because they all thought in the same way, but because they were all so different. They had different talents, different interests and different sounds but they found a process of working together where their differences stimulated each other to create something they wouldn't have come up with individually. It's in this sense that creativity draws not just from our own personal resources, but also from the wider world of other people's ideas and values. This is where the argument for developing our powers of creativity moves up a gear. Let's go back to Shakespeare's Hamlet. In Shakespeare's play, Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark, is torn by raging feelings about the death of his father and the treachery of his mother and uncle. Throughout the play, he wrestles with his feelings about life and death, loyalty and betrayal, and his significance in the wider universe. He struggles to know what he should think and feel about the events that are engulfing his spirit. Early in the play, he greets Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, two visitors to the royal Danish court. He welcomes them with these words, "'My excellent good friends, how dost thou, Guildenstern?' Our Rosencrantz, good lads, how do you both? What have you? My good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither. The question surprises Guildenstern. He asks Hamlet what he means by prison. Hamlet says, Denmark's a prison. Rosencrantz laughs and says, if that's true, then the whole world is a prison. Hamlet says it is, and a goodly one in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. Rosencrantz says, We think not so, my lord. Hamlet's reply is profound. Tis none to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. 
The power of human creativity is obvious everywhere. In the technologies we use, in the buildings we inhabit, in the clothes we wear, and in the movies we watch. But the reach of creativity is very much deeper. It affects not only what we put into the world, but also what we make of it. Not only what we do, but also how we think and feel about it. Unlike all other species, so far as we can tell, we don't just get on in the world, we spend much of our time talking and thinking about what happens and trying to work out what it all means. We can do this because of the startling power of imagination, which underpins our capacity to think in words and numbers, in images and gestures, and to use all of these to generate theories and artefacts and all the complex ideas and values that make up the many perspectives on human life. We don't just see the world as it is, we interpret it through the particular ideas and values that have shaped our own cultures and our personal outlook. All of these stand between us and our raw experiences in the world, acting as a filter on what we perceive and how we think. What we think of ourselves and of the world makes us who we are, and what we can be. This is what Hamlet means when he says, there is nothing good or bad, only thinking makes it so. The good news is that we can always try to think differently. If we create our worldview, we can recreate it too, by taking a different perspective and reframing our situation. In the 16th century, Hamlet said that he thought of Denmark metaphorically as a prison. In the 17th century, Richard Lovelace wrote a poem for his love, Althea. Taking the opposite view, Lovelace says that for him an actual prison would be a place of freedom and liberty, so long as he could think of Althea. This is how he closes his poem. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Mine's innocent and quiet take that foreign hermitage. If I have freedom in my love, and in my soul am free, angels alone that soar above enjoy such liberty. In the 19th century, William James became one of the founding thinkers of modern psychology. By then, it was becoming more widely understood that our ideas and ways of thinking could imprison or liberate us. James put it this way, The greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering their attitude of mind. If you change your mind, you can change your life. This is the real power of creativity and the true promise of being in your element. Chapter 4. In the Zone Eva Lawrence is the most famous female billiards player on the planet. Known as the Striking Viking, she's been ranked number one in the world, won both the European and US national championships. She's been on the cover of the New York Times magazine, been featured in People, Sports Illustrated, Forbes and many other publications. She makes regular television appearances and serves as a commentator on ESPN. Growing up in Sweden, Eva discovered the game while trailing after her elder brother. Me and my best friend, Nina, she said, we were always hanging around, just as close as friends can be. One day, when I was 14, the two of us followed my brother and his friend to this bowling alley to play, and decided to check it out. We were there for a while and then got really bored. And then we found out that they'd gone to something called a pool room. I'd never heard of pool. So we followed them up there. And I remember, the minute I walked in, I reacted to it right away. I loved the whole thing. This dark room with lights over each table, and the clicking of the balls. I just thought it was mesmerising right off the bat. There was this whole society, she said, where everybody knew this thing about billiards, and it grabbed me right away. We were intimidated and curious, but we just sat and watched everything. When you sit and watch it, or do it yourself, everything disappears. It's easy for that to happen with billiards because each table is a stage. So everything around it disappeared for me, and that's all I saw. I was watching these players who knew exactly what they were doing. I realised that there's more to this than just banging the balls around and hoping something goes in. There was one guy who ran ball after ball after ball and made 60, 70, 80 balls in a row. And I realised he was moving the white ball around to shoot his next shot. And somehow it clicked in. It was their knowledge and skill that really amazed me. That chess part of billiards, of playing three, four moves ahead, and then having to execute it on top of it. From that moment of epiphany, Eva knew that she wanted to dedicate her life to billiards. 
Fortunately, her parents supported her, allowing her to spend six to ten hours a day playing at a local pool room, doing her homework in between shots. People there knew, she said, that I was serious about the game, so they left me alone. But we also had a lot of fun there. If you find a place where everybody else likes the same thing that you do, it really becomes fun. So these odd characters, because we all had billiards together, we became like a family. In 1980, at 16, Eva won the Swedish Championship. At 17, she won the first ever European Women's Championship. This led to an invitation to go to New York to represent Europe in the World Championship. That whole summer, I practised. The pool room didn't open up until five in the afternoon, so I would take the bus in the morning up to the part of town where the owner lived, get the key to the pool room, and then take the bus into town and let myself in. I did that all summer, and then played ten, twelve hours a day. Then I went to the tournament in New York. I didn't win, though. I came in seventh. I was disappointed I didn't do better, but at the same time I thought, wow, that's like seventh in the world. Though her parents didn't like her being so far away, Eva decided to stay in New York to continue her pursuit of the sport, knowing that in the United States she'd have the opportunity to play regularly against the best in the world. In addition to scoring victories, she also became a leading voice for women in billiards. Her talent, her passion and her stunning good looks made her a media star and helped bring new levels of popularity to the game she loved. Fame and financial reward accompanied Eva Lawrence on her rise to the top. But for her, the biggest charge continued to be the game itself. You're almost unconscious to what's going on around you, she said. It's literally the most peculiar feeling. It's like being in a tunnel, but you don't see anything else. You just see what you're doing. Time changes. Somebody could ask you how long you've been doing it, and you, you could have said 20 minutes, but it was actually nine hours. I just don't know. I've never had it with anything before or since, even though I'm very passionate about a lot of things. But the feeling of playing billiards is unique for me. Part of the beauty that pool offers you is how much you can learn. It's a never-ending deal, she said. Every layout is different, so there's always something to keep you interested. I just love the physics and the geometry of it, learning and understanding the angles, and finding out how far you can push to change the angle to get the cue ball where you want it to go. And learning what the limits and possibilities are. Being able to control the cue ball scooting forward two and a half inches instead of three is a pretty amazing feeling. So instead of fighting the elements, you actually figure out a way to work with them. I wasn't at all interested or good at geometry or physics at school. For some reason, when I'm playing, I see it a lot. I look at the table, and I literally see lines and diagrams all over the place. I see, I'm going to make the one here, the two over here, the three is going to go down here, I'm going to have to go three rails round for the four, the six is down here, no problem, I've got seven, eight, nine, I'm out. I see them all lined up. And then, if you hit one ball a little bit incorrectly, all of a sudden, a whole new diagram in your head pops up. You need to resolve the problem because you're not where you wanted to be. You were six inches off. So now, you have to reformulate the whole thing. Geometry at school did not get my attention. Maybe if I'd had a different teacher, it would have been different. Someone that just said, Eva, think of it this way, or look at it this way and you'll get it. Or they could have taken our whole class to a pool room and said, check this out. But it was so boring at school. I couldn't even keep my eyes open in the class, you know. But now, when I give lessons to someone, I try to figure out as quickly as I can if they have hand-eye coordination. And also, are they just interested in the game, or are they interested in the geometry and the physics of it? Are they math-oriented? Eva has been playing billiards professionally for nearly 30 years yet she still gets the same charge that the sport has always given her. Even when I do an exhibition after all these years, she said, I get nervous. People say, well, you've done it so many times. But it doesn't matter. It's about being in that moment. Playing billiards puts Eva Lawrence in the zone. And being in the zone puts Eva Lawrence face to face with the element. The zone. To be in the zone is to be in the deep heart of the element. Doing what we love can involve all sorts of activities that are essential to the element, but are not the essence of it. Things like studying, organising, arranging, limbering up and so on. And even when we're doing the thing we love, there can be frustrations, disappointments and times when it simply doesn't work or come together. But when it does, 
It transforms our experience of the element. We become focused and intent. We live in the moment. We become lost in the experience and perform at our peak. Our breathing changes, our minds merge with our bodies, and we feel ourselves drawn effortlessly into the heart of the element. Aaron Sorkin is the writer of two Broadway plays, A Few Good Men and The Farnsworth Invention, three television series, Sports Night, The West Wing and Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, and five feature films, A Few Good Men, Malice, The American President, Charlie Wilson's War, and the soon-to-be-released Trial of the Chicago 7. He's been nominated for 13 Emmy Awards, eight Golden Globes, and the Academy Award for Best Picture. I never set out to be a writer, he told me. I always saw myself as an actor. I got an acting degree at college. I was so passionate about this that when I was in high school, I'd take the train into New York City when I was broke and wait until the second half of a play when there'd be empty seats to sneak into after the intermission. Writing for fun was not something I was ever introduced to. It always seemed like a chore. I'd written one sketch for a college party, and my teacher, Jared Moses, had said to me, You could do this for a living, you know, if you wanted. But I hadn't a clue what he was talking about. Do what, I thought, and I moved on. A few months after I'd left school, a friend of mine was going out of town. He had his grandfather's antique typewriter and asked me to hang on to it for him. At this time, I was paying a friend of mine $50 a week to sleep on his floor in a tiny apartment on the Upper East Side of New York. I'd got a job with a children's theatre company for a while and some work on a soap. That was in 1984 and I was doing the rounds of auditions. This particular weekend, he said, all of my friends were out of town. It was one of those Friday nights in New York where you feel like everyone but you has been invited to a party. I was broke, the TV wasn't working, and all there was to do was muck around with this piece of paper and the typewriter. So I sat down at it, and I wrote from nine o'clock at night until noon the next day. I fell in love with it all. I realised that all those years of acting classes and taking the train to the theatre wasn't about acting, but about what the play actually was. I'd been a cocky actor, I wasn't ever a wallflower, but writing had been so far removed from my consciousness until that night. The first play I wrote was a one-act play called Hidden in This Picture, and that was well received and reviewed. Then my sister, who's a lawyer, told me about a case in Guantanamo Bay involving some marines accused of killing a fellow marine. The story intrigued me, and I spent the next year and a half writing the stage play for A Few Good Men. When it was playing on Broadway, I remembered the conversation with Jared. I rang him up. Is this what you meant? I asked him. I asked Aaron how he feels when he's writing. When it's going well, he said, I feel completely lost in the process. When it's going poorly, I'm desperately looking for the zone. I have flashlights on, and I'm desperately looking for it. I wouldn't speak for other writers, but I'm basically an on and off switch. When I feel that something I'm writing is going well, everything in my life is good, and the things in my life that aren't good are completely manageable. If it's not going well, Miss America could be standing there in a swimsuit handing me a Nobel Prize, and I wouldn't be happy about it. Doing the thing you love to do is no guarantee that you'll be in the zone every time. Sometimes the mood isn't right, the time is wrong, and the ideas just don't flow. Some people develop their own personal rituals for getting to the zone. They don't always work. I asked Aaron if he had techniques of his own. He said he doesn't, and he wished that he had. But he does know when to stop pushing. When it's not going well, he said, I put it away and I try again tomorrow or the next day. One thing I do is drive around in my car with music on. I try to find some place where I don't have to think about driving too much, like a freeway, where you don't have to stop at red lights or turn or anything. What I don't do is watch other people's movies or television shows or read their plays for fear that they're going to be very good and either make me feel worse or simply make me inclined to imitate what they're doing. At its best, the process of writing for Aaron is completely absorbing. Writing for me, he said, is a very physical activity. I'm playing all the parts. I'm getting up and down from my desk. I'm walking around. When it's going well, in fact, I'll find that I've been doing laps around my house, way out in front of where I type. In other words, I've been writing without writing. Then I have to go back to where I am on the page and make sure I actually type what I just did. In all likelihood, you've had instances in your life where you've become lost in an experience the way Aaron Sorkin did when he finally connected with writing. 
You begin to do something you love, and the rest of the world slips away. Hours pass, and it feels like minutes. During this time, you've been in the zone. Those who've embraced the element find themselves in this place regularly. This isn't to suggest that they find every experience of doing the thing they love blissful, but they regularly have optimal experiences while doing these things, and they know they will again. Different people find the zone in different ways. For some, it comes through intense physical activity, through physically demanding sports, through risk, competition, and maybe a sense of danger. For others, it may come through activities that seem physically passive, through writing, painting, math, meditation, and other modes of intense contemplation. As I said earlier, we don't only get one element of peace, nor is there only one road for each of us to the zone. We may have different experiences of it in our lives. However, there are some common features to being in that magical place. Are we there yet? One of the strongest signs of being in the zone is a sense of freedom and of authenticity. When we're doing something that we love and are naturally good at, we're much more likely to feel centered in our true sense of self, to be who we feel we truly are. When we're in our element, we feel we're doing what we're meant to be doing and being who we're meant to be. Time also feels very different in the zone. When you're connecting this way with your deep interests and natural energy, time tends to move more quickly, more fluidly. For Eva Lawrence, nine hours can feel like 20 minutes. We know the opposite's true when you have to do things to which you don't feel a strong connection. We've all had experiences where 20 minutes can feel like nine hours. At those times, we're not in the zone at all. In fact, we're probably zoning out. For me, this time shift, the good one, not the bad one, happens most often when I'm working with people, and especially when I'm giving presentations. When I'm deep in the throes of exploring and presenting ideas with groups, time tends to move more quickly, more fluidly. I can be in a room with 10 or 20 people or several thousand, and it's always the same. For the first five or 10 minutes, I'm feeling for the energy of the room and trying things out to catch the right wavelength there. Those first minutes can feel slow. But then, when I do make the connection, I slip into a different gear. When I have the pulse of the room with me, I feel a different energy, and I think they do too, which carries us forward at a different pace and in a different space. When that happens, I can look at the clock and see that almost an hour has gone by. The other feature common among those familiar with this experience is the movement into a kind of meta-state, where ideas come more quickly, as if you're tapping a source that makes it significantly easier to achieve your task. You develop a facility for the thing you're doing because you've unified your energy with the process and the effort you're making. So there's a real sense of ideas flowing through you and out of you, that you're in some way channeling those things. You're being an instrument of them rather than being obstructive to them or struggling to reach them. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer Eric Clapton describes it as being in harmony with time. It's a great feeling, he says. You can see and experience this shift in all sorts of performances, in acting, in dance, in musical performances, and in sports. You see that people have suddenly entered a different phase. You see them relaxed. You see them loosen up and become instruments of their own expression. Grand Prix racer Jochen Rindt said simply that when he's racing, you ignore everything and just concentrate. You forget about the rest of the world and become part of the car and of the track. It's a very special feeling. You're completely out of this world and completely into it. There's nothing like it. Aviator Wilbur Wright described it this way. When you know after the first few minutes that the whole mechanism is working perfectly, the sensation is so keenly delightful as to be almost beyond description. More than anything else, the sensation is one of perfect peace mingled with an excitement that strains every nerve to the utmost, if you can conceive of such a combination. Superstar athlete Monica Sellers says, When I am consistently playing my best tennis, I am also consistently in the zone. But, she says, once you think about being in the zone, you are immediately out of it. Dr. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, you can call him Mike if you want, performed decades of research on the positive aspects of human experience, joy, creativity, the process of total involvement with life that he calls flow. In his landmark book, Flow, 
The Psychology of Optimal Experience, Dr. Csikszentmihalyi writes of a state of mind where consciousness is harmoniously ordered and people want to pursue whatever they're doing for its own sake. What Dr. Csikszentmihalyi calls flow, and what many others call being in the zone, happens, he says, when psychic energy or attention is invested in realistic goals and when skills match the opportunities for action. The pursuit of a goal, he says, brings order in awareness because a person has to concentrate attention on the task at hand and momentarily forget everything else. Dr. Csikszentmihalyi speaks of the elements of enjoyment, the components that comprise an optimal experience. These include facing a challenge that requires a skill one possesses, complete absorption in an activity, clear goals and feedback, concentration on the task at hand that allows one to forget everything else, the loss of self-consciousness, and the sense of time that transforms during the experience. The key element of an optimal experience, he says in flow, is that it's an end in itself. Even if initially undertaken for other reasons, the activity that consumes us becomes intrinsically rewarding. This is a crucial point to grasp. Being in the element, and especially being in the zone, doesn't take energy away from you, it gives it to you. I used to watch politicians fighting elections or trying to stay in office and wonder how they kept going. You see them travelling all over the world under constant pressure to perform, making critical decisions with every appearance and living irregular hours in a constant spotlight of attention. I wondered how they didn't fall over from sheer exhaustion. The fact is, though, that they love most of it or they wouldn't do it. The very thing that would wear me out is fueling them up. Activities we love fill us with energy even when we're physically exhausted. Activities we don't like can drain us in minutes even if we approach them at our physical peak of fitness. This is one of the keys to the element and one of the primary reasons why finding the element is vital for every person. When people place themselves in situations that lead to their being in the zone, they tap into a primal source of energy. They're literally more alive because of it. It's as though being in the zone plugs you into a kind of power pack. For the time you're there, you receive more energy than you expend. Energy drives all of our lives. This isn't a simple matter of physical energy we think we have or don't have, but of our mental or psychic energy. Mental energy is not a fixed substance. It rises and falls with our passion and commitment to what we're doing at the time. The key difference is in our attitude and our sense of resonance with the activity. As the song says, I could have danced all night. Being in your element, having that experience of flow, is empowering because it's a way of unifying our energies. It's a way of feeling deeply connected with our own sense of identity. And it curiously comes about through a sense of relaxing, of feeling perfectly natural to be doing what we're doing. It's a profound sense of being in your skin, of connecting to your own internal pulse or energy. These peak experiences are associated with physiological changes in the body. There may be a release of endorphins in the brain and of adrenaline through the body. There may be an increase in alpha wave activity and changes in our metabolic rates and in the patterns of our breathing and heartbeats. The specific nature of these physiological changes depends on the sorts of activities that have brought us to the zone and on what we're doing to keep ourselves there. However we get there, being in the zone is a powerful and transformative experience so powerful that it can be addictive, but an addiction that's healthy for you in so many ways. Reaching out. When we connect with our own energy, we're more open to the energy of other people. The more alive we feel, the more we can contribute to the lives of others. Hip-hop poet Black Ice learned at a very young age that his words could bring out emotions in himself and others. My mum used to make me write about everything, he told an interviewer when I got in trouble, when I was happy, or even when I was scared. I was a giddy little kid. When I started liking little girls, I used to write letters to my friends. Mine were better than the circle yes, no, maybe so. I came upon spoken word as an adult. I went to a poetry spot, looking to meet women. It was open mic night. And when this cat messed up, the audience gave him lots of love and support. I was blown away. Being the aggressive person that I am, it surprised me to see what I would talk about every day in the barber shop in spoken word form at the club. I was able to release what was on my chest and people would understand what I was saying. 
Black Ice, born Lamar Manson, moved from those early performances to increasingly bigger stages. He appeared for five consecutive seasons on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, was a lead cast member in the Tony Award-winning Deaf Poetry on Broadway, released his first album on a major label, and appeared in front of millions at the Live 8 concert. His message is life-affirming and motivating, speaking of the importance of family and the power of youth. To back up his words, he started the Hoodwatch movement organisation to help inner-city kids stay on the right track and understand the extent of their potential. Critics laud his work and audiences respond passionately, and when you see him on stage, you can sense that he's very much in the zone. For Black Ice, though, this entry into the zone comes from a sense of mission. My life has been so meaningful, he says, I have to write something that touches folks. I have a legacy to uphold. I grew up around great men. My father, my uncles and my grandfather are my heroes. And just in that alone, there are some things I could never say. I could never look my father in his face knowing I have something that's playing on the radio that's absolutely asinine. My voice is my gift, Black Eye says. It's pointless if I'm not going to say anything. It's mad important. I can see in society now how important it is. Sometimes I'm discouraged, but I definitely know what I can contribute. We are who we are, but I want to get at the kids and stay in the seven and eight year olds' ears, telling them, you're going to be something. There's no other compromise, there is no if or you might, you are going to be something. This is another secret of being in the zone. That when you're inspired, your work can be inspirational to others. Being in the zone taps into your most natural self. And when you're in that place you can contribute at a much higher level. One of the ideas that we've already discussed, and which we'll come back to again, there's no point using a good idea only once, is that intelligence is distinct for every individual. This is an especially important point to recognise when exploring the concept of being in the zone. Being in the zone is about using your particular kind of intelligence in an optimal way. This is what Eva Lawrence touches on when she talks about pool and geometry. It's what Monica Sellers connects with when her physical intelligence and her mental acuity become one, what Black Ice conjures when he weaves his words born of both careful observation and a refined ear for rhythm. Being yourself. When people are in the zone, they align naturally with a way of thinking that works best for them. I believe this is the reason that time seems to take on a new dimension when you're in the zone. It comes from a level of effortlessness that allows for such full immersion that you simply don't feel time the same way. This effortlessness has a direct relationship to thinking styles. When people use a thinking style completely natural to them, everything comes more easily. It's obvious that different people think about the same things in different ways. I saw a great example of this a few years ago with my daughter. Kate is very visual in her approach to the world. She's extremely bright, articulate and well-read, but she loses interest quickly during lectures, of all types, not just the ones involving the need for her to clean a room up. Not long after we moved to Los Angeles from England, her history teacher began a section on the Civil War. Not being American, Kate knew little about this period in American history, and she got very little out of her teacher's recitation of dates and events. This approach, filling students' heads with bullet points, had little impact on her. With a test coming up on the subject, though, she simply couldn't ignore the topic. Knowing that Kate had a very strong visual intelligence, I suggested that she consider creating a mind map. Mind mapping, a technique created by Tony Bazan, allows a person to create a visual representation of a concept or piece of information. The primary concept sits at the centre of the map, and lines, arrows and colours connect other ideas to that concept. I had the feeling that as someone who tends to think visually, Kate would benefit from looking at the Civil War from this perspective. A few days later, Kate and I went out to lunch, and I asked her if she'd had a chance to try out the mind map. As it turned out, she'd done much more than try it. Through this technique, she'd created such a strong visual representation of the Civil War in her mind that she spent the next 40 minutes telling me about the major events and the consequence of those events. By looking at it from this new perspective, one that made use of one of the primary ways in which she thinks, Kate was able to understand the war in a way that the bullet points never would have provided. Because she had produced a mind map, she was seeing the images in her mind clearly, as if she had photographed them. 
Getting out of the box. There have been various attempts to categorise thinking styles and even whole personality types so that we can understand and organise people more effectively. These categories can be more or less helpful as long as we remember that they're just a way of thinking about things and not the things themselves. These systems of personality types are often speculative and not very reliable because our personalities often refuse to sit still and tend to flutter restlessly between whatever boxes the testers devise. Anyone who's ever taken a Myers-Briggs test knows about the various box-placing tools out there. The Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, MBTI, is something that the human resource departments seem to enjoy using to type people. More than 2.5 million people take the MBTI annually, and many of the companies in the Fortune 100 use it. It's essentially a personality quiz, though more sophisticated than what you might find in the pages of a pop magazine. People answer a series of questions in four basic categories. Energy, attitude, perception, judgment, and orientation to life events and their answers indicate whether they're more one thing or another in each of these categories, for example, more extroverted or introverted. From the four categories and the two places in which people fall in these categories, the test identifies 16 personality types. The underlying message of the test is that you and each of the other 6 billion people on the planet fit into one of these 16 boxes. There are several problems with this. One is that neither Miss Briggs nor her daughter Ms. Myers had any qualifications in the field of psychometric testing when they designed the test. Another is that test takers often don't settle neatly into any of the categories when they take the MBTI. They tend to be just a little more to one side of the line or the other, a little more extroverted than introverted, for example, rather than being clearly one thing or the other. Most telling, though, is that many people who repeat the test end up in a different box when they do so. It's true in at least half of the cases, according to some studies. This suggests either that a huge percentage of the population has serious personality disorder problems, or that the test might not be such a reliable indicator of type after all. My guess is that 16 personality types might be a bit of an underestimate. My personal estimate would be closer to 6 billion, though I'll need to revise that estimate in future editions of this book because the population keeps growing. Another test is the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument. I feel a bit more relaxed about this one because it talks about cognitive preferences in terms that I believe most people would find acceptable. Like the MBTI, the Herman Brain Dominance Instrument, HBDI, is an assessment tool that uses participants' answers to a series of questions. It doesn't seek to put people in a box. Instead, it tries to show people which of four brain quadrants they tend to use more often. The A quadrant, cerebral left hemisphere, relates to analytic thinking, collecting data, understanding how things work, and so on. The B quadrant, the limbic left hemisphere, relates to implementation thinking, organizing and following directions, for example. The C quadrant, limbic right hemisphere, relates to social thinking, expressing ideas, seeking personal meaning. The D quadrant, cerebral right hemisphere, relates to future thinking, looking at the big picture, thinking in metaphors. The HBDI acknowledges that everyone is capable of using each of these thinking styles, but it tries to indicate which of these styles is dominant in any individual. The function of this seems to be that people are more likely to be effective at work, at play, at any pursuit, if they understand how they approach each of these tasks. Though I'm suspicious of typing people categorically, and I still think four modes may be too few, this seems to me to be a more open approach than Myers-Briggs. The risk in saying that there's a set number of personality types, a set number of dominant ways of thinking, is that it closes doors rather than opening them. To make the element available to everyone, we need to acknowledge that each person's intelligence is distinct from the intelligence of every other person on the planet, that everyone has a unique way of getting in the zone, and a unique way of finding the element. Do the math. At the age of two, Terence Tao taught himself to read by watching Sesame Street, and he tried to teach other kids to count using number blocks. Within the year, he was doing double-digit mathematical equations. Before his ninth birthday, he took the SATM, a math-specific version of the SAT, 
given primarily to college candidates, and he scored in the 99th percentile. He received his PhD at age 20, and when he was 30, he won a Fields Medal, considered the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, and a MacArthur Fellowship. Dr. Tao is extraordinarily gifted. He's earned the moniker the Mozart of Math, and his lectures, his math lectures, draw standing room only crowds. His academic record suggests that he could have been successful in several disciplines, but his real calling, his discovery of the element, came via math when he was still a toddler. I remember as a child, he said, being fascinated with the patterns and puzzles of mathematical symbol manipulation. I think the most important thing for developing an interest in mathematics is to have the ability and the freedom to play with mathematics, to set little challenges for oneself, to devise little games and so on. Having good mentors was very important for me because it gave me the chance to discuss these sorts of mathematical recreations. The formal classroom environment is of course best for learning theory and applications and for appreciating the subject as a whole, but it isn't a good place to learn how to experiment. Perhaps one character trait which does help is the ability to focus, and perhaps to be a little stubborn. If I learned something in class that I only partly understood, I wasn't satisfied until I was able to work the whole thing out. It would bother me that the explanation wasn't clicking together like it should, so I'd often spend a lot of time on very simple things until I could understand them backwards and forwards, which really helps when one then moves on to the more advanced parts of the subject. I don't have any magical ability, Dr. Tao told another interviewer. I look at a problem, and if it looks something like what I've already done, I think maybe the idea that worked before will work here. When nothing's working out, then I think of a small trick that makes it a little better, but still is not quite right. I play with the problem, and after a while, I figure out what's going on. If I experiment enough, I get a deeper understanding. It's not about being smart or even fast. It's like climbing a cliff. If you're very strong and quick and have a lot of rope, it helps. But you need to devise a good route to get up there. Doing calculations quickly and knowing a lot of facts are like a rock climber with strength, quickness and good tools. You still need a plan, that's the hard part, and you have to see the bigger picture. Terence Tao probably finds himself in the zone regularly. In addition to being born with rare skills, he is also extremely fortunate because he arrived at his version of the element when he was very, very young. He found the place where his brilliance and his passion met, and he never looked back. What we can glean from his devotion to math and the magnetic pull it has for him has resonance for all of us. I think it's significant that he discovered his passion at such a young age and could express it before he was out of diapers. I'm not certain about whether Dr. Tao was still in diapers at the age of two, actually. I suppose he could have been a toilet training genius as well. He could be what he was naturally inclined to be before the world put any restrictions on him. We'll talk about these restrictions later in the book. No one was going to tell Terence Tao to stop doing math because he'd make more money if he were a lawyer. In that way, he and others like him have an unencumbered path toward the element. But they provide a path as well. For they show all of us the value of asking a vitally important question. If left to my own devices, if I didn't have to worry about making a living or what others thought of me, what am I most drawn to doing? Terence Tao probably never had to wonder what he was going to do with his life. He probably never used the Myers-Briggs type indicator or the Herman Brain dominance instrument to determine which career options offered a spark for him. What the rest of us need to do is to see our futures and the futures of our children, our colleagues and our community with the childlike simplicity prodigies have when their talents first emerge. This is about looking into the eyes of your children or those you care for, and rather than approaching them with a template about who they might be, trying to understand who they really are. This is what the psychologist did with Gillian Lynn, and what Mick Fleetwood's parents and Eva Lawrence's parents did with them. Left to their own devices, what are they drawn to do? What kinds of activities do they tend to engage in voluntarily? What sorts of aptitude do they suggest? What absorbs them most? What sort of questions do they ask and what type of points do they make? We need to understand what puts them and us in the zone. And we need to determine what implications that has for the rest of our lives. Chapter 5. Finding Your Tribe For most people... 
a primary component of being in their element, is connecting with other people who share their passion and a desire to make the most of themselves through it. Meg Ryan is the popular actor best known for her work in such movies as When Harry Met Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. Her acting career has been buoyant for more than a quarter of a century. Yet she didn't imagine a lifetime in that profession when she was at school. In fact, the whole thought of acting, or even speaking in public, terrified her. She told me that at school performances, she always preferred to be on the bleachers than on the stage. She was a good student, though, and in the eighth grade, she was valedictorian. She was thrilled at her achievement, until she realised that she had to give a speech in front of the whole school. Although she practised for weeks, when she found herself at the podium, she simply froze in terror. She said that her mother had to go up onto the platform and bring her back down to her seat. And yet, she went on to become one of the most accomplished comedy actresses of her generation. This was in part because she found her tribe. Following a successful career at school, Meg won a scholarship to New York University to study journalism. She'd always loved to write, and her intention was to focus on becoming a writer, something she considered at the time to be her true passion. To help pay for tuition, though, she found work in the occasional commercial. This led to producers choosing her for a regular role in the soap opera As the World Turns, and to Meg's discovery that she loved travelling in this circle. I found the world of actors fascinating, she told me. I was around hilarious people. The job was like being in this nutty extended family. It was a kick. I was doing 16-hour days and I became more and more comfortable with the everyday of it. I loved the fact that we were always talking about why someone would do something and examining human behaviour. I found I had all these opinions about what my character would or wouldn't do. I didn't know where I got them from, but I had lots and lots of them. I would say things like, OK, that's what the subtext is, so why am I speaking my subtext? I'd find myself rewriting lines and really engaging in the character and their world. Every day we'd get a new script and I had to memorise all these lines. It was absolutely overwhelmingly engaging. There was no time to think about anything else. It was complete immersion. Still, after leaving As the World Turns and graduating from college, Meg didn't set off immediately for Hollywood. Believing she had more to discover about herself, she spent some time in Europe and even considered joining the Peace Corps. But when a movie offer took her to Los Angeles and she returned to the acting milieu, she found once again that she was in a rare place when doing this work. I met up with this really great acting teacher, she told me. Her name was Peggy Fury. Peggy started talking to me about the art and craft of acting and what being an artist meant to her. Sean Penn was in the class above me, and Angelica Houston, Michelle Pfeiffer and Nicolas Cage were there too. I was surrounded by people who worked from really deep, deep down in themselves and were interested in the human condition and the idea of bringing writing to life. All these things just started to bloom in my mind and in my heart and in my soul. So I stayed in Los Angeles and got an apartment. My agent in New York hooked me up with an LA agent, and that's when it all came together for me. Various movies have come along and taught me so many things and helped me grow as a human being. When I decide to do a movie, it may be because I think it's funny or I want to work with a particular actor. But in the end, it always has a profound effect on my life. If it's not the subject matter, it may be a particular group of people. My evolution is served by the different incarnations that are part of every single movie. Meg Ryan could have been many things. She has a genuine skill as a writer. She has considerable academic talents. She has a wide variety of interests and fascinations. However, when she's acting, she finds herself with a group of people who see the world the way she does, who allow her to feel her most natural, who affirm her talents, who inspire her, influence her, and drive her to be her best. She's close to her true self when she's among actors, directors, camera and lighting people, and all of the others who populate the film world. Being part of this tribe brings her to the element. A place to discover yourself. Tribe members can be collaborators or competitors. They can share the same vision or have utterly different ones. They can be of a similar age or from different generations. What connects a tribe is a common commitment to the thing they feel born to do. 
This can be extraordinarily liberating, especially if you've been pursuing your passion alone. Don Lipsky, one of America's most acclaimed sculptors and public artists, always knew that he had an artistic bent. There were some early signs that he had unusual creative energy. When I was a child, he told me, I was always making things. I didn't think of myself as a creative person, but as someone with nervous energy. I had to be doodling and putting things together. I didn't think of it as an asset. If anything, it was a peculiarity. This nervous energy made him feel different from other kids and sometimes uncomfortable. As a child, he said, more than anything else, you just want to be like all the other kids. So rather than me seeing my creativity as something special, it seemed to set me apart. Through elementary school and into junior high, Lipsky was pulled in different directions. He was academically bright, but bored by academic work. Academic work came very easily to me, he said. I would finish assignments very quickly, and with the least effort rather than the most depth. He was gifted in math, and his school moved him into an accelerated math group. But in other respects, teachers thought of him as an underachiever, because he did just enough to get by. He spent more time drawing on his books than thinking about what to write in them. When I should have been doing academic work, he said, I was drawing or folding paper. Rather than being encouraged, I was chided for it. One teacher strongly encouraged his artistic talents, but Don didn't take art that seriously. The teacher became so upset with Don that, he said, he literally wouldn't speak to me. Shortly afterwards, the teacher left, and another art teacher arrived at the school. He brought with him a revelation for Don. They had a very rudimentary welding setup in the sculpture department, he said, and he taught me how to weld. To me, it was like magic that I could actually take pieces of steel and weld them together. It felt like everything I'd done before in art was just child's play. Welding steel and making steel sculptures was like real adult art. Discovering welding was like finding the holy grail. Still, he wasn't sure what to make of this fascination. He didn't think of himself as an artist because he wasn't good at drawing. He had friends who drew well. While they were drawing, he said, I was playing with blocks or building things out of my erector set. None of that felt like real art. It was the kids who could draw a horse that looked like a horse that felt like the real artist to me. Even when he began winning school art shows for his sculptures, he never thought about going to an art school. When he graduated from high school, he enrolled at the University of Wisconsin as a business major. He subsequently switched his major to economics and then history, but he stayed away from the art department even though he found little inspiration in any other classes. In his final year, he bluffed his way into taking two electives, woodworking and ceramics, for which he wasn't actually qualified, but he loved and excelled in both. Most importantly, he felt, almost for the first time, the true exhilaration of working as an artist on his own terms. In the ceramics class, he also found something he'd been missing throughout his college experience, an inspirational teacher. He was a very romantic and enthusiastic guy, he told me. Everything he did was like an artwork. If he was buttering his bread, he was totally into it. He served as a model for me and made me think that I could really make my life by making things. For the first time, a career as an artist seemed possible and worthwhile to Lipsky. He decided to go to graduate school at the Cranbrook Art Institute in Michigan to study ceramics. Then, He hit an obstacle. His parents had encouraged his creative work as long as it was a hobby. When he applied to Cranbrook, his father, a businessman, called him in and tried to drum some economic sense into him. Don agreed. Studying ceramics made no practical sense. But it was all he wanted to do. His father looked at Don long and hard, saw that his mind was set, and stood aside. And when Don went to Cranbrook, he discovered a new world of people and possibilities. I'd had very little exposure to art students other than in the few courses I'd taken, he said. Cranbrook is almost completely a graduate school. There were maybe 200 art students there, and about 180 of them were graduate students. So for the first time, I was around a big body of people who were very serious, knowledgeable, and committed to making their artwork, and it was fantastic for me. I went to all the critiques, not just in the ceramics department, but in the painting department, the sculpture department, the weaving department, and everywhere, just soaking it all up. I spent a lot of time visiting with other students in their studios, absorbing what everybody was doing. I started to read the art magazines and go to museums and fully immerse myself in art for the first time. 
At Cranbrook, Don found his tribe, and it set him on a different path. Finding the right tribe can be essential to finding your element. On the other hand, feeling deep down that you're with the wrong one is probably a good sign that you should look somewhere else. Helen Pilcher did just that. She stopped being a scientist and became one of the world's few science comedians. She fell into it after falling out of science. In fact, falling around has been a theme of her professional life. As she puts it, I wasn't pushed into science, rather I stumbled. After school, she was offered a university place to study psychology and, as she puts it, to drink cider and watch daytime TV. After university, she told me, a generalised apathy and unwillingness to find a real job led her to take a one-year master's degree in neuroscience. At this point, science itself started to get interesting for Helen. There were big experiments, she said, brain dissections and ridiculously unflattering safety specs. Bitten by the science bug, and little else, she stayed on to complete her PhD. She learned some useful science, as well, she said, as how to play pool like a diva. She also learned something else. She enjoyed science, but scientists were not her tribe. In her experience, science, unlike pool, was not played on a level surface. I learned, she said, that seniority in the scientific community is inversely proportional to communication skills, but directly related to the thickness of trouser corduroy. She did learn something of her craft, too. I learned, she said, how to make forgetful rats remember. I made and grafted genetically modified stem cells into the brains of absent-minded rodents, which, shortly after my meddlings, went on to develop the cognitive capacities of a London cabbie. But at the same time, my own attention began to wander, she said. Most of all, she found that the world of science, as she experienced it, was not the utopia of free inquiry that she'd hoped for. It was a business. Whilst corporate science pours cash and man hours into medical research, she said, its downfall is that it's driven by business plans. Experiments are motivated less by curiosity and more by money. I felt disappointed and confined. I wanted to communicate science. I wanted to write about science. I wanted out. So she formed what she called a one-woman escape committee and started digging a tunnel. She enrolled for a diploma in science communication at Birkbeck College in London. And there, she said, she found like-minded friends. She was offered a degree in media fellowship and spent two wonderful months, she says, writing and producing funny science films for Einstein TV. She plucked up the courage to sell her freelance science writing to anyone who would have it. I hoard my words, she said, to radio, to print and to the internet. Finally, she left the laboratory and went to work for the Royal Society. My role, she said, was to find ways of making science groovy again, though that was not the official job description. And then, unexpectedly, she received an email message offering her primetime stage space at the Cheltenham Science Festival to do stand-up comedy about science. No sooner had she said yes than the panic set in. Science, as we all know, she said, is serious stuff. Einstein's theory of relativity does not a one-liner make. I enlisted the help of friend and fellow comedian and writer Timandra Harkness, and several pints later, the Comedy Research Project, CRP, was born. She went on to join the London Comedy Circuit, and for the next five years, as she put it, she cultured stem cells by day and audiences by night. The CRP became a live stage show where Tamandra and Helen counted down the five best things in science ever. Members of the audience, she said, find themselves joining in with the formula for nitrous oxide, volunteering to catch a scientist recreating early experiments in flight, and singing along with Elvis about black holes. The CRP, she says, aims to prove scientifically the hypothesis that science can be funny. We are methodologically sound, she told me. During each show, a controlled audience is locked into an identical adjoining room without comedians. We then assess whether this controlled audience lasts more or less than the experimental audience who are exposed to jokes about science. Preliminary data gathered from shows around the country looks promising. For Helen Pilcher, a life in science has given way to a life of writing and communicating about science. Leaving the lab was scary, she says, but not as scary as the prospect of staying. My advice, should you be contemplating making that leap, is to make like a lemming and jump. Domains and Fields
When I talk about tribes, I'm really talking about two distinct ideas, both of which are important for anyone who's looking to find their element. The first is the idea of a domain, and the second of a field. Domain refers to the sorts of activities and disciplines that people are engaged in. Acting, rock music, business, ballet, physics, rap, architecture, poetry, psychology, teaching, hairdressing, couture, comedy, athletics, pool, visual arts, and so on. Field refers to the other people who are engaged in it. The domain that Meg Ryan discovered was acting, particularly soaps. The field was the other actor she worked with who loved acting the way she did and who fed Meg's creativity. Later, she moved to another part of the domain, to film acting, and within that, from comedy to more serious roles. She extended her field as well, especially when she met Peggy Fury and the other actors in her class. Understanding Meg's domain and her connection to her field helps explain how the shy girl who couldn't give a valedictorian speech became an accomplished, world-renowned actor. When I was working, she told me, it was just me and a couple of other actors in a black room with a camera team. I wasn't worried about an audience because there wasn't one. The every day of it has no audience. The every day of it is a black soundstage with cameras and one other person you're doing scenes with. And the activity was so absorbing. These people were so great that I just got carried away in the whole process. The confidence she got from that experience was strong enough to carry her further into her domain and to fresh fields of people. Even now, though, she still dislikes talking in public or television talk show interviews. I do it if I have to, she said. I'd just rather not. It's just not who I am. I really don't feel comfortable in that spotlight. Brian Ray is an accomplished guitarist who's worked with Smokey Robinson, Etta James and Peter Frampton, and toured on bills with the Rolling Stones and the Doobie Brothers. He came to his domain early, and it ultimately led him to the inner circle of a hero that as a child he never dreamed he would meet. Brian was born in 1955 in Glendale, California, the year that Alan Freed coined the term rock and roll. He was one of four kids, including a half-sister, Jean, who was 15 years his elder. Jean would take me over to her girlfriend's house, he said, and they would be playing Rick Nelson, Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis while poring over photos of these guys. It had such a visceral impact on me. The reactions of these girls to this music that was pouring out of the radio and their response to these photos. There was a part of me that just got the whole thing, right then and there, at age three. My dad played piano, and we had a little phonograph-making kit. It had a microphone, and you could cut a record and put this other needle on it to play the record. I remember sitting at two or three with my dad at the piano and cutting records. Right out of high school, Jean started getting into music, and she joined a folk band called the New Christie Minstrels. They did a tour throughout the country. She'd tell us stories and would be glowing from this life that she'd grown into. Jean imparted to me her love and joy of music, and sealed that by bringing me to clubs and concerts when I was nine and ten years old. I would see and meet people that I worshipped. My brother was given a really nice Gibson guitar, plus lessons. He didn't have a big desire to play music, and while he was busy not caring about the lessons, I was busy practising on his guitar. Then I was given a $5 nylon string guitar by my sister Jean that she bought in Tijuana. I just started crying. My passion for music was so big that it was almost a crusade, without my meaning to or knowing that I wanted to share it and spread it around a little. I started a band with guys before I even knew how to tune a guitar. One Sunday night, when I was 10 or 11, we heard this new band on the Ed Sullivan Show, The Beatles. It was such a different kind of music. It was a mixture of that black R&B that I love so much, but it was mixed with some other X factor or element that I didn't know. It was from Mars. It changed everything. I knew I wanted to play music, but now they'd closed the deal for me. It was just the most exciting thing I had ever seen. It made being in a band seem like something that was doable and attractive and something I could do for a living. They took away all the maybe I'll be a fireman. I was driven now to what ended up being my life. In the next 20 years, Brian played with some of the most outstanding musicians of his generation. Then came the call he never expected, an invitation to audition for Paul McCartney's new band. He's been touring and playing with McCartney ever since.
Never in my wildest dreams, he told me, would I have thought that, you know, this little blonde kid sitting Indian style in front of the TV in 1964 would end up playing with that guy singing All My Loving and I saw her standing there on the Ed Sullivan show. There is something really gratifying, he said, about this story, this, you know, just being part of this scene. The people in this book have found their element in different domains and with different fields of people. No one is limited to one domain and many people move in several. Often breakthrough ideas come about when someone makes a connection between different ways of thinking, sometimes across different domains. As Pablo Picasso explored the limits of his blue and rose periods, he became fascinated with the collections of African art at the Musée d'Ethnographie de Trocadero in Paris. This work was vastly different from his, but it sparked a new level of creativity in him. He incorporated influences from the ceremonial mass of the Dogon tribe into his landmark painting Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and thus launched himself into the Cubist work for which he is most celebrated. As cultures and technologies evolve, new domains emerge, new fields of practitioners populate them, and old domains fade away. The techniques of computer animation have generated an entire new domain of creative work in cinema, television and advertising. These days, though, people aren't spending quite as much time as they used to illuminating manuscripts. Finding your tribe can have transformative effects on your sense of identity and purpose. This is because of three powerful tribal dynamics. Validation, inspiration, and what we'll call here the alchemy of synergy. It's not just me. Debbie Allen's career in dance, acting, singing, producing, writing and directing has dazzled and touched millions. Her career soared in 1980 with the hit TV series Fame. She holds the distinction of having choreographed the Academy Awards for six consecutive years, and she's won many awards herself, including the Essence Award in 1992 and 1995. She's the founder and director of the Debbie Allen Dance Academy, which offers professional training for young dancers and professionals. It also commissions opportunities for new choreographers and provides an introduction to dance for all ages. As a young child, she told me, very young, four or five years old, I can remember putting on my pink shiny bathing suit and tying a towel around my neck, climbing a tree and dancing on the roof of my house performing to the birds and the clouds. I was always dancing as a little girl. I was inspired by the beautiful pictures of ballerinas, because I was black and lived in Texas, I hadn't seen a dance performance, but I watched musical films, Shirley Temple, Ruby Keeler, the Nicholas Brothers. When the Ringling Brothers Circus came to town, when I saw the spectacle, the people in beautiful costumes and the dancers flying in the air, toes pointed, I just thought it was amazing. I was so inspired by movies, Margot Fontaine and Rudolf Nureyev were the most incredible things I'd ever seen. As a young girl, I couldn't go to serious dance school, she said, because everything was segregated. I joined DeBarto Studios. I got a full grant scholarship and attended ten dance classes a week. I still remember my first dance recital. I wore a white, shiny satin skirt, a white jacket and orange blouse, white tap shoes, and was playing a triangle. The feeling of performing, she said, was like being on top of the world. I was always wearing leotards as a child. In fact, at my 50th birthday party... One of my aunts brought a picture of me at age five in my leotard. I knew I was a dancer very early on. I first saw the Alvin Ailey Company, she said, at age 17. I knew then that I was going to throw away my point shoes, put on high heels and long white skirts and dance to that kind of music. I identified myself with them so much on stage. It was glorious. One summer, I went to the Spolito Dance Festival in the Carolinas. And that was when it all fell into place for me. I had ideas as a child, but I was challenged by segregation, and so this opportunity to be taught by Dudley Williams in those classes was amazing. Alvin Ailey was there. The resident dance company taught Revelations dance classes, and I just shone. They wanted me in the company, but Alvin thought I was too young. I never joined them, but I knew I had to do that kind of dancing and teach. She told me, the Debbie Allen Dance Academy is born out of my desire to give back. It offers all styles of dance from flamenco, African, modern and character to tap and hip-hop. We have incredible teachers from all over the world. Every child has the right to learn to dance. It's an incredible language. These are not the kids that are going to get into trouble, believe me. 
Connecting with people who share the same passions affirms that you're not alone, that there are others like you, and that while many might not understand your passion, some do. It doesn't matter whether you like the people as individuals or even the work they do. It's perfectly possible that you don't. What matters first is having validation for the passion you have in common. Finding your tribe brings the luxury of talking shop, of bouncing ideas around, of sharing and comparing techniques, and of indulging your enthusiasms or hostilities for the same things. Making this connection was a significant spur to many of the people we've met so far in this book, from Matt Groening to Eva Lawrence to Meg Ryan to Black Ice and to many of those ahead. Being among other artists at Cranbrook gave Don Lipsky a deeper sense that what he was doing mattered and was actually worth doing. He said, In graduate school, I started taking seriously for the first time the little doodles I'd made. If I saw a rubber band in the street, I'd pick it up and then start looking for something to wrap around it or combine it with. That's the sort of activity I'd always done. But when I was in graduate school, I realised that that indeed was sculpture. Although modest, it really was art-making and not just passing time. Some people are most in their element when they're working alone. This is often true of mathematicians, poets, painters and some athletes. Even with these people, though, there's a tacit awareness of a field. The other writers, other painters, other mathematicians, other players who enrich the domain and challenge their sense of possibility. The great philosopher of science, Michael Polanyi, argues that the free and open exchange of ideas is the vital pulse of scientific inquiry. Scientists like to work on their own ideas and questions, but science is also a collaborative venture. Scientists, he says, freely making their own choice of problems and pursuing them in the light of their own personal judgment are in fact cooperating as members of a closely knit organisation. Polanyi argues passionately against state control of science because it can destroy the free interactions on which genuine science depends. Any attempt to organise the group, he says, under a single authority would eliminate their independent initiatives and thus reduce their joint effectiveness to that of the single person directing them from the centre. It would, in effect, paralyse their cooperation. It was partly this pressure on science that made Helen Pilcher jump ship from stem cells to the comedy stage. Interaction with the field, in person or through their work, is as vital to our development as time alone with our own thoughts. As the physicist John Wheeler said, if you don't kick things around with people, you're out of it. Nobody, I always say, can be anybody without somebody being around. Even so, the rhythms of community life vary in the element, just as they do in daily life. Sometimes you want company, sometimes you don't. The physicist Freeman Dyson says that when he's writing, he closes the door. But when he's actually doing science, he leaves it open. Up to a point, he says, you welcome being interrupted, because it's only by interacting with other people that you get anything interesting done. How do they do that? Finding your tribe offers more than validation and interaction, important as both of those are. It provides inspiration and provocation to raise the bar on your own achievements. In every domain, members of a passionate community tend to drive each other to explore the real extent of their talents. Sometimes the boost comes not from close collaboration, but from the influence of others in the field, whether contemporaries or predecessors, whether directly associated with one's particular domain or associated only marginally. As Isaac Newton famously said, if I saw further, it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants. This is not just a phenomenon of science. Bob Dylan was born in Hibbing, Minnesota in 1942. In his autobiography, Chronicles, he tells of his sense of alienation from the people there, from his family and from the popular culture of the day. He knew he had to get away from there to become whoever he was going to be. His one lifeline was folk music. Folk music, he said, was all I needed to exist. I had no other cares or interests besides folk music. I scheduled my life around it. I had little in common with anyone not like-minded. As soon as he could, he moved on instinct to New York City. There he found the artists, the singers, the writers and the scene that began to unleash his own talents. He'd begun to find his people. 
but among all of those who inspired and shaped his passion, there was one who led him to an artistic place that he'd never imagined. When he first heard Woody Guthrie, he said, it was like a million megaton bomb had dropped. One afternoon in the early 1960s in New York City, a friend invited Dylan to look through his record collection. It included a few record albums of old 78s. One was the Spirituals to Swing concert at Carnegie Hall, a collection of performances by Count Basie, Mead Lux Lewis, Joe Turner and Pete Johnson, Sister Rosetta Tharp and others. Another was a Woody Guthrie set of about 12 double-sided records. Dylan had listened casually to some of Guthrie's recordings when he was living in Hibbing, but hadn't paid them close attention. This day in New York City was going to be different. Dylan put one of the old 78s on the turntable. And when the needle dropped, he said, I was stunned. I didn't know if I was stoned or straight. He listened in trance to Guthrie singing solo a range of his own compositions. Ludlow Massacre, 1913 Massacre, Jesus Christ, Pretty Boy Floyd, Hard Travelling, Jack Hammer John, Grand Coulee Dam, Pastures of Plenty, Talking Dust Bowl Blues, and This Land is Your Land. All of these songs together, said Dylan, one after another, made my head spin. It made me want to gasp. It was like the land parted. I'd heard Guthrie before, but mainly just a song here and there, mostly things that he sang with other artists. I hadn't actually heard him, not in this earth-shattering kind of way. I couldn't believe it. Guthrie had such a grip on things. He was so poetic and tough and rhythmic. There was so much intensity, and his voice was like a stiletto. Guthrie sang like no other singer Dylan had listened to and he wrote songs like no one he'd ever heard. Everything about Guthrie, his style, his content, his mannerisms, came to Dylan as a revelation of what folk music could be and had to be. It all just about knocked me down, he said. It was like the record player itself had just picked me up and flung me across the room. I was listening to his diction too. He'd perfected a style of singing that it seemed like no one else had ever thought about. He would throw in the sound of the last letter of a word whenever he felt like it, and it would come like a punch. The songs themselves, his repertoire, were really beyond category. They had the infinite sweep of humanity in them. Not one mediocre song in the bunch. Woody Guthrie tore everything in his path to pieces. For me, it was an epiphany, like some heavy anchor had just plunged into the waters of the harbour. Dylan listened to Guthrie for the rest of that day, as if in a trance, as he put it. It wasn't only a moment of revelation about Guthrie, it was a moment of truth for Dylan. I felt, he said, like I'd discovered some essence of self-command, that I was in the internal pocket of the system, feeling more like myself than ever before. A voice in my head said, so this is the game. I could sing all these songs, every single one of them, and they were all that I wanted to sing. It was like I'd been in the dark and someone had turned on the main switch of a lightning conductor. By travelling to New York City to find like-minded people, Dylan was looking for himself. By discovering the journey of Woody Guthrie, he began to imagine his own. Like Newton, he saw further because he stood on the shoulders of giants. Circles of Influence Tribes are circles of influence, and they can take many forms. They may be scattered far and wide, or huddled closely together. They may be present only in your thoughts, or physically present in the room with you. They may be alive, or dead and living only through their works. They may be confined to a single generation or cross over them. Nobel laureate Richard Feynman spoke of ultra-miniaturized machines long before anyone had any thought of creating such things. Years later, Marvin Minsky, inspired by Feynman's idea, became the founding father of artificial intelligence and moved the conversation forward. Then, K. Eric Drexler approached Minsky at MIT and asked the esteemed professor to sponsor his thesis on miniature devices. That thesis served as the foundation for Drexler's pioneering work in nanotechnology. Through an extended, multi-generational tribe, a concept that critics dismissed as purely science fiction when Feynman introduced it became a reality. When tribes gather in the same place, the opportunities for mutual inspiration can become intense. In all domains, there have been powerful groupings of people who have driven innovation through their influence on each other and the impetus they have created as a group. Sociologist Randall Collins writes about how nearly all great philosophical movements came via the dynamics of tribes. In ancient Greece, 
The history of philosophy, he said, can be recounted in terms of a series of interlinked groups, the Pythagorean Brotherhood and its offshoots. Socrates' circle, which spawned so many others, the acute debaters of the Megara school, Plato's friends who constituted the academy, the breakaway faction that became Aristotle's peripatetic school, the restructuring of the network that crystallised with Epicurus and his friends withdrawing into their garden community, and their rivals, the Athenian Stoics, with their revisionist circles at Rhodes and Rome, the successive movements at Alexandria. If it can happen in ancient Greece, it can happen in Hollywood. The documentary Easy Riders Raging Bulls examines what they describe as the raucous, inspired and occasionally sordid cultural revolution that led to the reinvention of Hollywood filmmaking in the 1960s. In a few short years, the bobby socks and beach blankets that characterise wholesome 1950s Americana were replaced with sex, drugs and rock and roll. Inspired by the French New Wave and British New Cinema, a new generation of directors and actors set out to revolutionise American cinema and make films that express their personal vision. The breakthrough successes of landmark films such as Easy Rider, The Godfather and Taxi Driver gave these filmmakers unprecedented financial and creative independence. The box office and critical success of their films forced the old guard of the Hollywood studio system to relinquish their power. This became the age of a new breed of iconic filmmakers, such as Francis Ford Coppola, Robert Altman, Martin Scorsese, Peter Bogdanovich and Dennis Hopper. With each success, the filmmakers gained greater creative control. They created a culture of feverish innovation as each inspired the others to explore new themes and forms for popular movies. This newfound freedom also gave birth to an explosion of excess, ego, soaring budgets and a seemingly endless supply of drugs. Eventually, the filmmakers' mutual support and encouragement degenerated into intense competition and bitter rivalries. The emergence from this culture of blockbuster movies such as Jaws and Star Wars changed the landscape of Hollywood films once again, and creative and financial control returned to the hands of the studios. The power of tribal clustering was clear too in the period of wild inventions surrounding the software industry that accompanied the dawn of the personal computer. Silicon Valley has had a huge impact on digital technology. But as Dorothy Leonard and Walter Swapp have noted, it's surprisingly small geographically. Viewing the valley from the flight approach to San Francisco International, they say, one is struck by how small the region is. As Venture Law Group's Craig Johnson notes, Silicon Valley is like any gas that's compressed. It gets hotter. Its tribes overlap socially and professionally based on work discipline. Software engineers, for example. Organisational affiliation, like Hewlett Packard or background, Stanford MBAs or South Asian immigrants. The most skillful players don't have to travel far to make deals, change jobs or find professional partners. John Durr of Kleiner Perkins is fond of saying that the Valley is a place where you can change your job without changing your parking spot. Shared values also bind long-time Silicon Valley natives. The personal convictions of the Valley's remarkable innovators who created not just a company, but an industry, still echo through the community. Bill Hewlett and David Packard influenced the older generation directly. Many of them were early employees. Through this old guard, collegiality and high standards for performance are being carried down to next generation entrepreneurs. Other examples of tribes inspiring individuals to greater heights abound. The sports teams, the 1969 New York Knicks, the no-name defence of the undefeated 1972 Miami Dolphins, the 1991 Minnesota Twins, that performed as a collective that was more distinguished than any of the individuals, the Bauhaus movement in architecture in the early decades of the 20th century. In each case, the physical clustering of a tribe of creative individuals led to explosive innovation and growth. The Alchemy of Synergy The most dramatic example of the power of tribes is the work of actual creative teams. In Organising Genius, The Secrets of Creative Collaboration, Warren Bennis and Pat Ward-Biederman write of what they call great groups, collections of people with similar interests who create something much greater than any of them could create individually, who become more than the sum of the parts. A great group can be a goad, a check, a sounding board, they say, 
and a source of inspiration, support and even love. The combination of creative energies and the need to perform at the highest level to keep up with peers leads to an otherwise unattainable commitment to excellence. This is the alchemy of synergy. One of the best examples of this is the creation of Miles Davis's landmark album, Kind of Blue. While music lovers of every sort widely consider the recording a must-have, and legions of jazz fans, and classical and rock fans for that matter, know each note of the album by heart, none of the players on that album knew what they were going to play before they entered the studio. In the original liner notes to the album, pianist Bill Evans says that Miles conceived these settings only hours before the recording dates, and arrived with sketches which indicated to the group what was to be played. Therefore, says Evans, you will hear something close to pure spontaneity in these performances. The group had never played these pieces prior to the recordings, and I think without exception, the first complete performance of each was a take. In fact, the songs that appear on the album are all the first full takes, with the exception of flamenco sketches, which was a second take. When trumpeter Miles Davis gathered Evans, along with tenor saxophonist John Coltrane, alto saxophonist Julian Cannonball Adderley, pianist Winton Kelly, bassist Paul Chambers and drummer Jimmy Cobb in the studio in 1959, he laid out the scales, itself somewhat revolutionary since jazz at the time was traditionally built around chord changes. And then he turned on the tape recorder. Each of these players was an active participant in the tribe moving jazz in new directions at that time, and they'd worked together in the past. What happened during the kind of blue sessions, though, was a perfect storm of affirmation, inspiration and synergy. These artists set out to break barriers. They had the skill to take their music in new directions, and they had a leader with a bold vision. Their improvisational work that day was the result of powerful creative forces merging and creating something outsized, the ultimate goal of synergy. When the tape started rolling, magic happened. Group improvisation is a further challenge, said Evans. Aside from the weighty technical problem of collective coherent thinking, there's the very human, even social need for sympathy from all members to bend for the common result. This most difficult problem, he said, is beautifully met and solved on this recording. The music they created in those next few hours, working with each other, playing off each other, synchronising with each other, challenging each other, would last several lifetimes. Kind of Blue is the best-selling jazz album of all time, and, nearly 50 years later, still sells thousands of copies every week. Why can creative teams achieve more together than they can separately? I think it's because they bring together the three key features of intelligence that I described earlier. In a way, they model the essential features of the creative mind. Great creative teams are diverse. They're composed of very different sorts of people with different but complementary talents. The team that created Kind of Blue was made up of extraordinary musicians who not only played different instruments, but brought with them different musical sensibilities and types of personality. This was true, too, of the Beatles. For all that they had in common, culturally and musically, Lennon and McCartney were very different as people, and so too were George Harrison and Ringo Starr. It was their differences that made their creative work together greater than the sum of their individual parts. Creative teams are dynamic. Diversity of talents is important, but it's not enough. Different ways of thinking can be an obstacle to creativity. Creative teams find ways of using their differences as strengths, not weaknesses. They have a process through which their strengths are complementary and compensate for each other's weaknesses too. They're able to challenge each other as equals and to take criticism as an incentive to raise their game. Creative teams are distinct. There's a big difference between a great team and a committee. Most committees do routine work and have members who are theoretically interchangeable with other people. Committee members are usually there to represent specific interests. Often a committee can do its work while half the members are checking their blackberries or studying the wallpaper. Committees are often immortal. They seem to persist forever, and so often do their meetings. Creative teams have a distinctive personality and come together to do something specific. They're together only for as long as they want to be or have to be to get the job done. One of the most famous examples of powerful teamwork is the administration of President Abraham Lincoln. 
In her book, Team of Rivals, Doris Kearns Goodwin tells the story of Lincoln and four members of his cabinet, Edward M. Stanton, Secretary of War, Salmon P. Chase, Secretary of the Treasury, William H. Seward, Secretary of State, and Edward Bates, the Attorney General. These five men were unquestionably part of the same tribe, passionate in their desire to lead and move America forward. However, each of the four others had opposed Lincoln openly and bitterly prior to his presidency. Stanton once even called Lincoln a long-armed ape. Each had strongly held positions that sometimes differed greatly from Lincoln's. In addition, each of them believed they were more deserving of the presidency than the man the people had elected. Still, Lincoln believed that each of these rivals had strengths the administration needed. With an equanimity difficult to imagine in current American politics, he brought this team together. They argued ceaselessly and often viciously. What they found in working with each other, though, was the ability to forge their differing opinions into sturdy national policy, navigating the country through its most perilous period through the effort of their combined wisdom. Lost in the Crowd There's an important difference between being in a tribe, as I'm defining it, and being part of a crowd, even when the members of a crowd are all there for the same reason and feel the same passions. Sports fans come to mind immediately. There are vociferous and passionate fans all over the sports landscape. Football devotees in Green Bay, soccer, or as those are from the rest of the world know it, football, enthusiasts in Manchester, ice hockey zealots in Montreal and so on. They cover their walls, their cars and their front lawns with team paraphernalia. They might know the regular lineup for their local teams when they finished in fourth place in 1988. They might have postponed their weddings because the date conflicted with the World Series or the European Cup. They're dedicated to their teams, rhapsodic about their teams, and their moods might be dictated by the performance of their teams. But their fandom doesn't place them in a tribe with their fellow fans, at least not in the way that I'm describing it here. Fan behaviour is a different form of social affiliation. Some people, including Henri Tafel and John Turner, refer to this as social identity theory. They argue that people often derive a large sense of who they are through affiliation with specific groups, and tend to associate themselves closely with groups likely to boost their self-esteem. Sports teams make fans feel as though they're part of a vast, powerful organisation. This is especially true when the teams are winning. Look around at the end of any sports season, and you'll notice team jerseys of that season's champion sprouting all over the street, even in places far distant from the team's home city. Fans boast their affiliation with victorious teams much more loudly because at some level they believe that being associated in a tangential way with such a team makes them look better. The social psychologist Robert Cialdini has a term for this. He calls it basking in reflected glory, or berging. In the 1970s, Cialdini and others conducted a study about berging and found that students at a number of American universities were much more likely to wear university-related clothing on the Monday after their school won a football game. They also found that students were more likely to use the pronoun we regarding the team, as in, we destroyed state on Saturday, than they were if their team lost. In the latter instance, the pronoun usually switched to they, as in, I can't believe they blew that game. The point about berging, as it relates to our definition of tribes, is that the person doing the basking has little or nothing to do with the glory achieved. We'll give a tiny bit of credit to the effect of fan support if the fan attended the actual sports event. Though serious sports fans are a notoriously superstitious lot, only the most irrational among them actually believe that their actions, wearing the same hat to every game, sitting perfectly still during a rally, using a specific brand of charcoal during the tailgate party, have any impact on the results. Membership of a fan group, whether it's the Cheeseheads or Red Sox Nation, is not the same as being in a tribe. In fact, such membership can create the opposite effect. Tribe membership, as I define it here, helps people become more themselves, leading them towards a greater sense of personal identity. On the other hand, we can easily lose our identity in a crowd, including a group of fans. Being a fan is about being partisan, cheering or jeering and finding joy in victory and agony in defeat. This might be fulfilling and thrilling in many ways, but it normally doesn't take you to the element as a means of self-realisation. In fact, fandom is in many ways 
a form of what psychologists rather awkwardly call de-individuation. This means losing your sense of identity through becoming part of a group. Extreme forms of de-individuation lead to mob behaviour. If you've ever been to a European soccer match, you know how this can apply to the sports world. But even in more benign versions, it results in a sense of anonymity that leads people to lose inhibitions and sometimes perform acts they later regret, and in most cases do things outside their normal personalities. In other words, these actions can take you far from your true self. My youngest brother Neil used to be a professional soccer player for Everton, one of the major teams in Britain. Whenever I was in Liverpool, I would watch him play. It was an exhilarating and often terrifying experience. Football fans in Liverpool are very enthusiastic, let's say. They're passionate about winning, and when things on the pitch aren't going as well as they'd like, they willingly offer tactical advice from the terraces. It's a form of mentoring for the players and often for the referee too. If Neil failed to place a shot exactly where the fans wanted it, they would scream words of encouragement. Poor shot, Robinson, they might say, or come on, you can do better than that, surely. Or words to that effect. On one occasion, there was an hysterical outburst from someone immediately behind me, offering a robust criticism of my younger brother's tactics, in words that implicated my mother, and by extension me. On instinct, I whirled around to deal with what was clearly a question of family honour. When I saw the manic fan's sighs and facial expressions, however, I, I agreed that he was probably right. Crowd behaviour is like that. Look, listen and learn. Some spectators really are skilled critics, and what they think about an event can genuinely help others to make better sense of it. The domains of literary criticism, music journalism and sports commentary all have distinguished members whose words speak to us deeply and who belong to tribes passionately dedicated to extending the discourse. This is different from simple fandom. It's a performance in the service of fandom that has definable levels of excellence and the makings of a true calling. Sportscaster Howard Kossel called one of his autobiographies I Never Played the Game. Yet he served for decades as one of the most important and influential voices in the US sports world. My guess is that Kossel found his element in sports, even though he wasn't an athlete. He knew he could enhance the average fan's sports experience and found a greater sense of who he was in doing so. Kossel once said, I was infected with my desire, my resolve, to make it in broadcasting. I knew exactly what I wanted to do and how. He was one of a key group of enthusiasts who became active participants in the world they admired by bridging the space between the players and the audience. And in every crowd and every audience, there may be someone who's responding differently from everybody else, someone who is having his own epiphany, someone who sees his tribe not on the bleachers around him, but on the stage in front of him. Billy Connolly is one of the most original and one of the funniest comedians in the world. He was born in a working-class area of Glasgow, Scotland, in 1942. He struggled through school, which he mostly disliked, and left as soon as he could to become an apprentice welder in the Glasgow shipyards. He served his time there, learning his trade and also 